Hi everybody, welcome back to Moscone West. We're here at RSA 2024. This is the Cybersecurity Conference. My name is Dave Vellante. Shelly Kramer is also here with David Linthicum. I'm really excited to have Scott Leach in the house. He's the Vice President of APAC for Veronis and Mahesh Shanmugasandaram, the Country Manager for India, both from Veronis. Gents, hopefully I got it right. Absolutely right. All right. Surprise. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to theCUBE. Good to have you guys. Welcome to the United States. Thanks for having we us. Got, we got a, we are welcome. You got, you got uh, Australia and India. Absolutely. So you, how are you guys hanging? You doing okay? We're doing all right, actually. We flew in Saturday night, so we're fairly acclimatized now to the time zone. So we're doing better than expected. Yeah, so the yeah. premise that we're going to talk about today is, is cybersecurity is a data problem. Right? You guys are treating it as such. You can't, if you don't have a, a really a data house in order, you're going to have trouble you know, getting your cyber house in order. Explain that premise in a little bit more detail. Sure, Scott. I mean, if you think about what the threat actors are interested in today, it is all about data. You know, businesses are getting broken into because attackers want their data. And so if you don't understand where your data is, if you don't understand where your data's exposed, if you don't understand how it's being used, how can you properly protect it? So that's part of the problem we help organizations solve. And, and, and data's everywhere. Absolutely. Right, so it's very dispersed. Yeah. So that makes the problem harder because the, 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 the threat surface gets, gets widened. Absolutely. Um, what's your take on this for the, the, the perspective from the, the market in India? Yeah, it's the same almost like how it is globally, right? You, you, you nailed it. The attack surface around data has increased exponentially now, you know, with data being everywhere and users are accessing it from anywhere and any device, it becomes imperative for organizations to understand how are actors engaging with data, and is it risky or not, and what data are they engaging, and why are they engaging? Is it because that information is overexposed, or are they supposed to access? I think this problem is increasing more than what it was, and uh, most security professionals are aware of it, and they're looking to address this challenge. One of the conversations we started having you know, several years ago was cloud became the sort of first line of defense, yeah. and then, it really put a lot of pressure on developers. You know, that term shift left, meaning developers have to actually secure at the point of code, because infrastructure is code. The cloud model is a shared responsibility model. You know, developers generally don't want to be worried about security, they want to be worried about writing code, and now, so they got, they got data to worry about, they got security to worry about, and they've got to deploy the infrastructure. Granted, it's easier with code, but of course they also have to deliver it for the business. So it's a really complicated situation. Tell us a little bit more about how Veronis thinks about this problem. I think, I think you need to think about it in terms of how do you protect the data. There are always lots of ways in, whether you're coming in through an endpoint, whether you're coming in through cloud, whether you're coming in through network. But if the target's always data, you really need to focus first on protecting the data. One of the interesting trends we're observing at the moment is generative AI. So technologies like Copilot, there's a lot of talk in the market about how do we deploy technology like Copilot to surface our data. And one of the challenges we're hearing from a lot of our customers is generative AI technology makes it really easy for people to find and access data that they probably shouldn't have access to. You know, we've seen examples in the market where you know, maybe I'm a disgruntled worker and I want to ask how much is my boss being paid or who else got a bonus last quarter. If, you know, if I've got access to that information, Gen AI technology makes it really easy for that to be returned to me. And so we're seeing a lot of interest in how can we deploy these technologies securely. And so how do you guys help solve that problem? Mm. Yeah, primarily through three ways, right? We help organizations know what data is important and where all is it residing. Ensure that only right people have access to information with right permissions, because we, do, we have to do this because when we perform assessments, we see close to about 40 to 50 percentage of information being overexposed and people getting access to information irrespective of whether they need it or not for their job. So we help organizations to get that visibility. And lastly, which I think is very, very critical, is to help organizations to track information usage patterns. Like say, the way Mahesh would engage with data stores at Veronis is going to be drastically different if my credentials are with a hacker or it's used by a malware. So we help organizations to understand these information usage patterns, detect suspicious activity, and contain it. So that's, so, yeah. So visibility, who has access, and yeah. then basically those usage patterns. And what do you do with that data? Where does that go? How do you, how do you act on that? I'd, I'd probably simplify the message even further, right? I'd say it comes down to really three things. Kind of find, fix, and alert. So how do you find the sensitive information across your business? 
How do you figure out what information there is exposed? Yeah. And once you figure out the exposure, how do you fix it? How do you get back to that zero trust model for data so that I've only got the access to the information I need to do my job and not access to a whole lot more? And then once we fix the exposure, how do we alert when we see unusual access patterns occurring to data? So that's a different sort of meaning of alert. Yeah. Right? It used to be a pager wakes you up in the middle of the night, hey, yeah. and you know, turn this thing off because I'm getting so many false positives. But, but you're using it in a different context, explain. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're using it for data, right? We're looking at what normal access to data looks like, and then when we see unusual access patterns to data, we're alerting on it, but we're not just alerting on it and we're not just throwing a whole lot of noise over the fence. We've invested in a 24-7 managed data detection and response offering so that Veronis analysts are actually triaging and helping drive the investigations around those data-focused alerts. So we're taking responsibility for helping secure our customers' data, not just inundating them with, with noise. And Go ahead, please. I just want to add to what just Scott mentioned. I think, yeah, you touched upon it. I mean, alerts, people get a lot of alerts. How much of that is noise? So it's critical to add enough context to an alert so people can act on it, right? And that's where I think we are significantly different. Since we understand data and we monitor data access patterns, we are able to add that missing context on whether what, what is the risk that particular threat is providing for that organization in terms of data. And uh, that's where I think most of our customers see a lot of value. And like Scott mentioned, when this is compounded with our uh, MDDR managed data detection and response service with the cybersecurity skill shortage issue. We not just alert, but we also engage with them proactively, communicate the top risks that we see through our platform and help them to manage and remediate it. When I was, years ago, when I was working at IDC, we were a global company, and there was always stark differences in adoption patterns and technology usage by region. Yeah. And there's still, still some, but, but when Thomas Friedman wrote that book, The World is Flat, yeah. From a technology perspective, certainly cultural differences and, and, and local laws, you know, mm. much different, privacy laws, it, you know, take some time to filter through. They might start in the EU and filter across the globe, but generally speaking, you know, access to technology has been pretty much democratized. So yep. I'm wondering, when you guys talk to CISOs in the region, mm. and you talk to CISOs here, is it, do they have the same problems what kind of conversations are you having with them and how are they the same, how are they different? I, th I think from my perspective, they're largely the same mm -hmm. across the region. I think as a, as a cyber industry, we've kind of failed historically, right? I think we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to stop the bad guys from breaking in. You know, we've invested a lot in perimeter defenses, in endpoint, in monitoring networks, in putting in place firewalls, and we've kind of lost sight of what is it the attackers are really after? And that is data. And I think across the world, CIOs, CISOs, boards, executives, are now getting to terms with actually we need to protect our data. We need to understand where it is, we need to understand what's sensitive, we need to understand how it's being used, and we need to make sure it's protected. And we're seeing that trend you know, right across the region. So, I've been saying, I said earlier today, Frank Slootman, former CEO of Snowflake, said to me one time, and I think he wrote this in his book, it wasn't just to me, I'm sure he said it to a lot of people, but if you have 10 priorities, you got none. Yeah. And when you talk to CISOs, you ask them what their priorities are, they list a list, like 20 priorities. So very, very challenging. Where does data fit on that priority list? I, I think it should always be the priority, and people, I mean, security practitioners, practitioners are understanding that, that it has to be the top priority now, again, because of the way the business has evolved. Like I just mentioned earlier, since data is now everywhere, I, I firmly believe that cybersecurity was predominantly designed, or most organizations approach cybersecurity to, to address these risks. The actor who's going to access the critical asset, how are they protecting the asset, and the medium with which the actor is engaging with the asset. So mostly cybersecurity controls were revolving around these. But if we focus on that, the key asset for organizations are always users and data. And if organizations make data as their data, I mean, uh, focus, they I think would be able to probably establish a lot of controls which are meaningful and be, would be able to predict a lot of breaches and contain it before it creates a significant impact. Now you guys are founded to secure data, so you're very biased, but I happen to be a data person, <laughs> so I, I, I sort of agree with you. Yeah. But now we have Gen AI, yeah. so now that's yet another yeah. data problem so it's like this gift that keeps on giving to Veronis. But, but how are you <laughs> thinking about uh, you know, the whole um, ascendancy of LLMs? Mm. What kind of new data problems does that, um, that bring, to the, bring to light? 
So I think if you think about the, the, the data problem historically, organizations always knew they had a lot of sensitive information buried across different systems, on-prem and in the cloud. But that data was often very difficult to find, right? Unless a user was going to go start browsing file servers and start you know, trolling through SharePoint sites, the chances of them finding and exposing sensitive data were probably buried in the obscurity and challenges of the, you know, just the mountain of data that organizations were sitting on. Problem with Gen AI is that problem's gone away now. I can just ask it a really simple question, you know, show me all of the usernames and passwords that I've got access to. Yeah. You know, show me the information on that merger and acquisition we're thinking about making. You know, show me how much my boss is getting paid, show me who's been complaining to HR. And if that information exists somewhere in the mountain of data and I've got access to it, Gen AI will surface that data back to me. So it makes discovery of that sensitive information much, much easier. Mm. So. And, and it's just what Scott mentioned, it's just not about the user getting it, it also gets into the LLM, right? And what data gets into the LLM, God knows what happens with that, right? So it's, it's critical for organizations to ensure that access permissions are enforced appropriately and they govern how AI is being used. Yeah, a lot of that leak into the public domain. Yeah. Y you know, um, last year at this event, you know, yeah. you, the thing I love about theCUBE is you can develop you know, patterns over time and you can see how things shift, but one of the big conversations last year was does, does AI generally and specifically gen AI give the advantage to attackers or defenders? And the consensus was at the time Initially, it's going to be a, a benefit to attackers, but over time, defenders, for things like security posture management, uh, the SecOps experience, are going to, uh, the, the, the pendulum will swing to defenders. Where are we, in your view, in that? I, I think it's still to be proven out, right? I think it's still early days. I think at the moment, we're still seeing a lot of benefit for attackers in Gen AI technology. You know, being able to get their hands very easily on sensitive information without having to do lots of reconnaissance. You know, we've seen examples of them being able to use it to craft pretty compelling phishing emails to gain access into systems. And so I think we're seeing the attackers drive more of that early stage adoption of AI. I think businesses still tend to be a little bit conservative. You know, one of the things we're seeing is a lot of these AI programs still stuck in pilot because organizations are worried about the security risks of deploying Gen AI at scale across their businesses. Mm -hmm. I agree with Scott. I think, I mean, always, I mean, unfortunately, uh, you know, security or security practitioners try to defend against what hackers innovate, right? So uh, that's, that's happening, but I think AI specifically gives a unique opportunity for security practice, practitioners to focus around data. And if they did that, they probably are establishing a proactive cybersecurity framework and understand more about what, what's happening around data and predict breaches and contain them. As you guys know, cybersecurity industry is the worst mm. in terms of buzzwords and acronyms yeah. that you, know, you got to look up all the time. Yeah. You know, posture management, uh, data security posture management, relatively new, even though the concept of posture management is mm. not new. I think it's Gartner's fault, actually. They keep coming up with all these terms because they can make a lot of money by slicing the salami, and they do a good job of, of, of educating folks. Uh, but what do you guys see with respect to data security posture management? Again, relatively new concept. You guys are at the heart of that. What can you tell us? Look, I think it's a new term to describe a problem that's been around for a while, right? Which is the one we've been talking yep. about. It's, you know, how does an organization get a handle on what sensitive information have they got, where is the exposure, how is it being used, and how do we mitigate that exposure through automation, and how do we alert on it when we see unusual activity occurring. I think, as you say, it's just a, it's a nice new term in the market to define a problem that's been around for a while. The problem is, how do we focus on protecting data? And, and the reason probably why it's getting more popular now is because the problem is much bigger than what it was. I mean, data was always within a fixed perimeter or, a, or a, a, an asset, now it's just everywhere, and it's very critical for organizations to understand the posture. And probably that's why this term is there, but yeah, it's, it's a problem that existed and will continue to exist, so it's important for organizations to understand posture around the critical data and manage it efficiently. And look, I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing regulators catch up, right? We're seeing increased regulation around Absolutely. data. 
Um, yeah, we're seeing increased fines and penalties around organizations not doing the right thing yeah. with their data. Yeah. We've seen big breaches in the market that have involved lots of people's personal, personally identifiable information. And so I think there's a lot more awareness around the need to protect data. And as you say, the analysts are jumping on the back of that. Yeah. And we might see another magic quadrant appear yeah. shortly in this space. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well you've heard it here first in the cube. Okay, <laughs> what about this, the whole operations technology and critical infrastructure? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, to your point, Scott, a lot of the data used to be buried inside mm -hmm. of applications, so it was somewhat hard to find. It was somewhat insulated. The same thing with a lot of critical infrastructure. It used to be air-gapped, mm -hmm. and now it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, connect the grid to the internet. Hey, yeah. that's a good idea, uh-oh. <laughs> and so you see some of the concerns that that brings up. Data's flowing everywhere. Yeah. Now that just increases the, the risks by, many orders of magnitude. How, what are you seeing in terms of the data flow there? Can you help with that problem? Look, we can definitely help with that problem. As, as you know, Mahesh talked about yeah. earlier, it, it really is a, an attack surface problem, right? Data used to be you know, just in a back-end system, properly secured by IT. Now you've got data everywhere, on-prem, in the cloud, in critical infrastructure systems that are now connected to the network. You've got collaborative applications like Office 365. You've got data in your SaaS applications like Salesforce and Box and GitHub and Jira. And it's a, it's a whole of data problem, right? And that is part of the problem that Veronis helps to solve is go out across all of those different data stores, help organizations identify where their sensitive data is, where it's exposed, and help automatically protect it. So, we talked about the, the acronym SOUP earlier. You guys, all you have to do is put another D into the acronym, so MDR becomes MDDR. It you does, guys had, yeah. You guys had, an announcement around managed data detection and response, yeah. MDDR. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, so if you think about you know, what was the or is the MDR space, the managed detection and response space, that was often focused on perimeter telemetry, right? It was organizations wanting to make sure that they had logs from their network, from their endpoints, from their firewalls, but often what was neglected there was any sort of data related activity. And so that's really our focus as a business is on making sure that we understand how users are interacting with data and whether that access is normal or abnormal. And if it's abnormal, how do we then help organizations understand the risk and take action in response to the risk? So our offering is the first of its kind in the market where we've got a team of analysts working 24 seven, looking at all of these data focused alerting and helping our customers to triage those alerts, investigate those alerts and then take action in response to the alerts that we're seeing. And I think this is very critical because like you just mentioned, there's been so much noise that most SOC analysts are looking at. What to prioritize is a big issue. With the cybersecurity skill shortage, it's even bigger a problem for them. So by just getting to understand what data is at risk because of the threat, and was there a material breach or not, it's going to help uh, these SOC analysts to prioritize threats and manage them efficiently through our support. And that's, that's the domain that we're operating through. I mean, to me, anything you can do to affect the SOC analyst experience and improve it, yeah. I, I, clearly AI has the potential to do that. Yep. Yeah. Managed services, I, I've been a huge fan of for many, many years, because that individual is just maxed out. Yeah. And yeah. that just increases the risk. Um, you guys look great, by the way, considering you know, it's your middle of your, your bedtime here, but um, <laughs> what, what are you seeing at RSA? What's, what's exciting to you? We'll close there. Look, I think it's just the scale of the event's exciting, right? Yeah. I think we were talking before about, you know, there being maybe 45,000 people here this year, hundreds of vendors talking about new technologies. I think AI and data is what I'm most excited about this year. I think come, starting to see some of these technologies come together to deliver real outcomes for organizations to help them reduce their risk is what I'm most excited about seeing this year. How about you, Mahesh? Uh, for me, it's just all about networking. Um, I think there's a huge contingent from India, customers, partners, they're here. Uh, we had a great opportunity to host most of them and introduce them with our execs. So I think I'm excited about networking and get our customers and partners from India connect with our executives and understand our vision. So Great, well thanks for the work that you do. Appreciate you guys coming on theCUBE and supporting our, our mission to serve our audience. Thank Appreciate you so it. much for the opportunity. Uh, you bet, all right, and thank you for watching. We'll be right back. This is Dave Vellante, Shelly Kramer, and David Linthicum. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of RSA 2024 live from Moscone West. We'll be right back. Thank you.